the title of this workshop is managing your online classroom so just to go through what are the objectives how to maintain order and discipline in a virtual environment how to build a well-functioning team and how to make online children's ministry exciting so those are just the three things that we're going to be focusing on this afternoon all right so we're going to start with the first one how to maintain discipline in a virtual environment now what are some of the things that we use to maintain discipline in a face-to-face -face environment just just one word not an explanation just name what if you were in a your sunday school one thing that you would use to maintain discipline you know order in your sunday school well we gave them rules to follow that's right very good and just the same way we have rules in a face-to-face -face setting now i have some notes and stuff that i want to share with you so um if you want to jot down a few things go ahead however i will be sharing um some notes and other um stuff with you by the end of this workshop so you could engage all right so yes rules are important but we're gonna get to rules one of the things that really help to foster order and discipline is relationship all right so we want to start before we even get to rules we want to start with a warm welcome because we, we're already distanced because of what you know just being online being in that space right and we want to be able to create a space of warmth so what we want to begin with is being accessible and what does that mean for us being accessible means number one we need to be online before the children are even there that's right we have to be there and we have to be waiting for them i remember many years ago um in rbct rbc now in saint augustine and they were just restructuring their service and before work I went in, I started to work at 8.30. So I had a little time. I just wanted to do one little thing. So I went and I was waiting from since 7.30. And when I walked into the bank, there was, there was staff waiting, standing up by the door at a different point to greet me. I felt so special. <laughs> I felt so special, right? Just the same way when the children come on, and we're there waiting for them and they don't have to sit waiting for us in silence or just listening to music there could be conversation they feel you know welcome and wanted so be there and it gives an opportunity for us to have a little chat and to find out a little more about what is happening with them all right it creates an atmosphere of familiarity okay the second one is being hospitable Greet the children, as we mentioned before, but greet them by name. Greet them by name. Yeah. Hi, Johnny. How are you? Hi, Rebecca. Hello, Aisha. You understand? Greet them by name and let them know that you're glad to see them. Be warm and excited about their return. Let them know that you're happy that they came back on. All right? And also let them know, even when they're leaving, that you're looking forward to seeing them next week. Okay? So when they leave, they will know, number one, they were happy that I came and they want to see me again. Be personable. Follow up on some of the conversations that you started. Meaning that when you ask them what's going on, be attentive. If you're a forgetful person, take notes. If you have a little ledger with all the children's names, meaning we, we be purposeful about it, right? Follow up. So you could take a little note. Okay, Aisha, you're talking to her. She says, oh, she has an exams or tests and the term test starting next week. Make a note of that 
if you're talking, you know, to Shelly. And she says, oh, her grandmother is sick. Take a note of that and then follow up on it. Ask about things that they would have mentioned so that they would know that you are really wanting to build a relationship with them. All right, how does that sound? Any other tips that you all could put forward? Uh, I would just like to come, um, share uh, quickly about that personable and greeting them. Um, years ago when I started as um, National Director of Child Evangelism in Fellowship, our first office was in a building where they had other offices. And I had a, I started a Good News Club with the children. And they, the Good News Club was on Friday afternoons after school. And these children would come and, you know, they would enjoy hearing about the Lord. So they started coming during the week. So one day I was out of office and when I came back, I saw flower petals from the door. The, the office was on the upper flat. I saw flower petals way from the door, up the stairs to the office door. I don't know if any of you saw coming to America, there were these petals all over. So when I got there, the landlord said to me that um, the people in the other offices complained how the children are making noise and you know he was making a fuss. So when I had club I told the children I said okay club is on Fridays and so I'd like to come on Friday afternoon. And anyway one day little Linda came and she stood at the door and she had a little folded note she tore her uh, page out of her um, exercise book and sheepishly she stretched her hand. So I took the note and I opened it. And in the note, I read the note. I don't have to see that note. It is imprinted on my heart. In that note, it said, Dear Miss Adams, A D A M C, that's how she spelled Adams. Dear Miss Adams, I love the Bible club. I love when you teach me about Jesus. But Miss Adams, when I come, I look into your eyes to see if you want me to come. Seven years old. And that broke my heart. She said, I look into your eyes. So she's looking to see if there's any irritation because she didn't come on Friday. She came on Monday or she came on Tuesday. You know, and I hugged her and I said, you know what? Come any day that you want to come. And so I allow them to come. So that is so important, Harriet, that they must feel this personality, this personalness from you, that you want them to come, not just words, but they look at your face. But she said, I look at your eyes. Yeah. And children can tell if you really love them or if you're just putting on a shoe. I just wanted to share that testimony. Thank you so much. And you are very correct. They, they know, they know, you know, it, your, your intention then. All right. So we're going to move on to discipline and rules for your virtual children's ministry. So we have, you know, four steps that must or should be taken when you consider what your rules are going to be um, for your virtual children's ministry or any children's ministry as a matter of fact. Now, your rules must be clear. Make it yeah. simple and explain it. All right? So make the rules simple and even as simple as you make it, explain what you want from them. Second, be consistent. And that has two uh, roles in terms of being consistent. Don't be wishy-washy, meaning that rules apply this week, but they don't apply the next week. Or they apply to some, but they don't apply to others. All right? Decide on what your rules are going to be beforehand. If you need to make minor adjustments, make them quick 
And then even when you make those adjustments, explain to them why you're doing it, okay? And make sure that the rules are repeated every single session that you have so that it becomes yes. a, internalized and a part of the culture of your ministry. Our third step, make, they're, to, they're supposed to be corrected. Make sure that you have, whether they be penalties for breaking disciplinary codes or rules and rewards for keeping them. Why is that important? I'll tell you this. Look at it in our society, and I know sometimes we like to treat children as adults, but they're not. <laughs> they're not adults, they're children. All right? That's right. If, if you think about how we are, there are penalties attached to rules for adults in society. Now, I'm not talking about spanking, right? But within the sphere of what your uh, children's ministry holds, you can be creative and think about, and it's not to disband them and tell them don't come because that, that really doesn't help. Um, what, and I'll just say what we do, we actually let them earn their rewards and we let them know that they can do things to lose the rewards that they earn. All right? So there. Uh, there is uh, don't just punish for bad behavior but reward for good behavior as well so that is part of being corrected you want to correct any naughty behavior or unchrist like behavior in them and not don't only do it through discipline and rules and rewards but do it in your teaching as well if you observe that there is a disciplinary problem or an, a problem with obedience in your, uh, you know, your, your ministry with among your children, do an object lesson on obedience, right? Teach them Bible uh, memory verses and explain it and share what that means, that God, you know, requires their obedience and being obedient in club and to their parents is a form of being obedient to God. And our fourth step is to be considerate. Now, yeah, we are going down hard and fast. Be clear, be consistent, be corrective, but be considerate. Pre be prepared to go deeper into why a child may not be able or willing to keep one or two of your rules. So for instance, one of our rules are to put your cameras on because we want to be able to interact with your children. If you have a child who refuses to put their camera on, at some point in time, probably not during the club, whether do you have to do a wrongs or welfare check and you check on the child and you ask in person, you know, I realize, Sita, that you're not putting your camera on. Is there a reason, right? Uh, Tim, you know, this is one of the rules that we have. Or you speak to the parent. You know, Tim is supposed to have his camera on and he's not having it on. Is there a reason why? Because the other children are keeping the rules. We don't want it to look like it is preferential treatment. There is so much you may find out. It may be that the child might be embarrassed about where they live. It could be that you know, so much is going on in the background that the parent wants them to come on, but, you know, it exposes too much of the home. So just be prepared to show that consideration. And then when you go into your club, you can say that you don't have to give a reason, reinstate your rules and say, for now, so-and-so is not able to put their camera on but everyone else is still required to, all right? Uh, is that, how does that sound to you? Are there any questions or comments before I move on quickly? It's that clearly stated. Good. Yes, I think it's clearly stated yeah. and, you know. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna share with you, CEF developed some rules for Good News Club and they're called UPS rules. Now, they're called UPS rules, obviously, because we all have up in it, okay? 
and it's easy for the children to understand. It's catchy, children like that. All right, so we have these five ups rules. Sit up, look up, listen up, hand up, and zip up. So you notice one thing you're not seeing there is shut up or hush up, right? <laughs> zip up, because even with rules, you wanna be careful that you don't use derogatory language, you know, or anything that is insulting to the child, even in rules. And you wanna be consistent to maintain that all the time. So these are rules that we use in a face-to-face -face, uh, good news club, our UPS rules. And every single club, we go over these rules with the children. All right, now for online, we have different rules that would apply. And I'm just gonna run through them quickly. First rule would be bring your Bible. Right, it was a rule before a club and you're able to check it out easily. But this rule is bring your Bible. Have your Bible present with you when you come online. Second, mute yourself. As you come in, stay muted. And listen, this is a big problem. But we'll go into uh, at the end of uh, a little more later in terms of how we could address this. Right, this is a problem with even adults forgetting that they're unmuted. It happened to me today. Right, forgetting that they're unmuted and speaking. So you, you have to remember to remind kids, you know, to stay muted. Put on or put your name on the screen. Why is this important? Because sometimes, especially when you're online and a child speaks or anybody speaks, you don't know who it's coming from. Right? And you don't want to start guessing who it is. So so, and it helps you to get to know the child as well, especially if you're dealing with a child who might be coming on because somebody invited them to come online, but you don't know them. They normally wouldn't be a part of your ministry. Camera on, it helps with engaging. Sometimes you want to do actions, right? You want them to do an action. You want to be able to go in and see them doing the action, right? Or you want to see if, you're, if they're lost or not. If they, they're just on, but they're doing other things, right? That's one of the things that face-to-face -face would afford us. You could catch their eye and see, okay, they're drifting off. I need to do something to pull this class back. And then we go on to sit up, but they're home. Yes, we don't want them lying down in their beds. We don't want them sprawling out on their chair, right? Or we want them to be just as alert and sitting in an upright position where they'll be able to grasp. And it's even more important at home because there's so many other distractions and comforts. Listen up. They're still to be attentive. Be attentive because we're going to ask questions. We're going to call on you. We want you to be sharp. So listen to what is being said. And hand up. Use the hand up tool. And some of them, they may start off a bit shaky and depending on the device that they have, they don't always get it. But there are ways to work around that, especially when it comes to review games. Divide them in groups. Make it simple. Girls against boys. So that, you know, it's easy for everybody to feel that they're a part of a team, even though they might be quick on the draw. Or you go through and you call, you know, you see, okay, this student might be, or this child might be a little slower to get to their device so let me probably sing them single them out and ask them a question to let them know that okay i see you there you're not being ignored you know and you can contribute to the session as well all right so those are some of the rules that we use uh, for our online children's ministry can I say something there, Carrie? Sure, I just, sure. Yeah. Um, also, what I find is that many teachers, when we talk about rules, they're so serious, you know, and some of my goodness about teachers, you know, it's like when they're talking about rules that the children are, oh, you know, rules that they're now in this trade jockey. Yeah. But what I would say when it's time for rules, I would say, and now it's time, it's time for rules for how having fun and then you know i would say fun uh, you're talking about rules and and then i would ask them how do you think rules can allow us to have fun and you 
would be surprised. The very children would say, so miss, we can pay attention. And so miss, you don't have to tell us stop talking. So I always make it a big thing, rules for having fun. And guess what? I think tomorrow I will um, share what um, Israel did. After Israel was trained and he came to the actual club and he heard me saying, I know, it's time for rules for having fun. The next day, I saw on our screen, Israel did something so wonderful with rules for having fun in, and incorporating all the rules and the children just love it. So, you know, that's one thing you need to do, put in that enthusiasm. Don't make them feel as though, you know, you're holding a big stick and you must do this and you must do that. Okay. You put some enthusiasm and make it fun for the children. So that's just a little tip. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Claudette. Yes, tone is very important. Tone is extremely important, right? And that it, it should carry throughout the club as well. So we're going to move on to building a well-functioning team and the need for defined roles and functions. How will that help you to manage your virtual classroom? As a matter of fact, it helps you to manage any classroom. You need a team, right? You need an even, even if it's a team of two, you need to know who is doing what. Okay? Even if it's a team of two, you need to know who is doing what. Know who is doing what. So I'm going to discuss this as if it's a church doing a ministry. However, if you are somebody who is doing a community ministry like Derek, um, this is something you can divide the roles accordingly to see who is going to do what. So we're going to start with, and we're talking about being online here. So the role of an admin. So I have here like a chat in terms of at least what, what, what we need. We have an administrator, we have a host, co-hosts, teachers, and counselors. And I'm gonna break down why I have these five roles and why they're important. Now, an administrator, especially for an online program, that is a person who is solely responsible for doing everything when it comes to capabilities. And I'm not talking about the person, there's a person who has host by their name. That person should be the host, especially if you're in Zoom or if you're in um, Google Meet, you know, whoever the admin would be there. But that person is responsible for letting, okay, we have 15 minutes, for letting persons in when they come in, if that is, if there's a waiting room, that person is responsible for giving, adding co-hosts, for giving teachers the ability to share screen, for disabling annotation. There's this thing in Zoom, I, 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 I'm not sure if it's in Google Meets, where, you know, if it's open, if annotations are abled, sometimes the children, when they touch their, their pads, their, their iPads or their, their tablets, you see them marking all on the screen. So you need somebody who is attentive to that, who will go in and disable that. And that person will also be managing the breakout rooms as well. All right, yeah. setting them up beforehand. So this person should have the host or the admin privileges. Now keep in mind, we're talking about a virtual setting. Next, we have the host. The host is different from the administrator. Why? The host is the person who is responsible for the program. The administrator is responsible for the platform. Right? Because it is very difficult for a person to do both, especially if you have a large group. If you have a class of 20 children online or more, to manage all of them, manage a platform and the host, it, it is difficult. All right? So the host can occasionally assist the admin with admin duties, 
such as letting people in if the administrator is doing something else or maybe needs to, you know, step away from their screen for a bit. Greet the teachers and students as they come in. Take attendance, right? As the children are coming in to know who is there and who is not. If you, you're in our uh, Good News Club and Sunday schools, we award points for attendance and for punctuality. So the, the host would be the person who would do that. Maintain order and enforce the rules. That would be the responsibility of the host to, it sounds hard, but it's really not. That host is just reminding children when they come in, you know, remember to put your, your, your camera on and to mute yourselves, all right, so that, you know, you can hear what's going on and, and stuff like that. That is the responsibility of the host because you don't want all the teachers calling it out at the same time. So that would land on the shoulder of the host. Time management. Reminding uh, the teachers and just those who are the presenters of, you know, where they're at in case somebody slips or, or, or misses their cue, giving that little nudge, you know, for that person to come in. And overseeing the structure and the flow of the program, right? So the host should have co-host capabilities. The administrator would be the host or the admin, and the host would have co-host capabilities to be able to do that. So are there any questions before we move on to co-host or prefects? Okay. So I have co-hosts and I have prefects as well. Prefects sound so much like school, but yes, um, your co-host, slash prefects would be those persons now who would occasionally assist with admitting people into the meeting. They would help in meeting persons, right? So a co-host, especially in Zoom, I'm not sure for, for Google Meet, can go in and if a, a child maybe forgot to mute themselves or even a, a person and it's distracting from the presentation, the co-host should now scan the participants and just mute accordingly all right help with greeting uh children or students as they come in monitor the chats let me tell you something these children know how to operate the state so well they go in and sometimes they have their own conversations back and forth all right so the co-host once they see things pop up they can monitor the chat to make sure that number one, if it's a, a, a conversation that is distracting them from paying attention, to encourage them to be attentive. Or sometimes children, you know, have questions and they would post it in the chat. The co-host could draw it to the attention of the presenter or to the host, or they might need help. You may hear, um, I can't see, or I can't hear and the co-host would be able to pay attention to that. It will be difficult for an administrator or even a host or presenter to have to do that at the same time, right? And I have here prefects. You may have adults who are the ones, you know, who would be co-hosts and taking over in certain roles, but you may have some grown children, whether it be preteens or teenagers who are responsible just like we have Israel, you know, who seems to have a knack and a desire to serve, that you could assign as a prefect who would help you with muting children as well, or maybe at helping, right? Or if he observes something, to probably draw it to the attention of an adult. Okay, so you can have some prefects, assign one or two, not too many, you don't want to give them too much work because they still need to be attentive, but they can assist with at least with muting. Helping students, what some of the things that the co-host would also do would be helping the children to find their classroom. If you have breakout rooms and you have a Sunday school environment, you know, sometimes when 
especially if they're new to it, for them to go into a breakout room, they take a while. So helping, uh, especially new children who are new to their Sunday school, helping them to find their place. That's the role of the co-host or prefect, you know, in that situation. Monitoring reactions. If somebody put their hand up when you have your review question time, right? Now, the thing about with, your, with the hand up too is that the person who puts their hand up first, it goes in, in sequence. So first, second, third. And co-host can help to see okay, well, who has their hand up, who, whose hand up is for asking a question or responding to the invitation when it comes to salvation or, and things like that. So the co-host would help with monitoring with those things and helping students in any way possible. It could be something technical that, you know, the child may not be able to navigate. The co-host can call in and help with that and adding and removing spotlights. Why are spotlights important? Because if you have, let's say 30 persons on a platform and that person is speaking, when you have the spotlight on them, regardless of who else speaks, that person's image remains fixed on the screen. So then if a demonstration is being done, if somebody else speaks, it doesn't take away that person, who, the other person who's speaking doesn't pop up on the screen and that demonstration is lost to the other participants. Now, all of these people, as I said, should have co-host capabilities as well. Now, feel free to stop me at any point in time, all right? I'm moving on to teachers and the role of the teachers and we know it's soon teaching and presenting, whether it be Bible lessons, songs, memory verses, stories, like missionary stories or an object lesson, craft, and also, you know, these, our teachers should have screen sharing capabilities as well. They can be co-hosts as well, but it's best that if a teacher is in the process of presenting, that that co-host duty, if possible, be passed to someone else for the period of time that the teacher is presenting. And then when they're done, they can pick it up again. And, you know, so that should be understood that they should not be performing the task of teaching and muting children and letting people in simultaneously. And then we have our counselors who would counsel the children for salvation, who would pray, and pray for them and give assurance of salvation if there is a child who has a question, right? And to help with discipline. I use the word discipline, uh, not necessarily in a punitive way, you know, but just in terms of if there is a situation where a child is continuously being disrupted to be able to, be able to call that child in, whether it be a breakout room or a phone call afterwards to just discuss, probably discuss why. As I said, you know, the goal is to be corrective. Okay, the goal is to be corrective. Um, teachers and co-hosts. Five minutes. I saw, I saw it, yes. Teachers and co-hosts, they can be counselors, but at least one person should remain free to conduct co-host duties or that person who is uh, set to counsel should not have any kind of, you know, responsibility when it comes for that time. All right, so CEF, our mission is always to lead or to lead a child to Christ, lead children to Christ. Once we have given a clear message of salvation, once we have expressed understanding to be able to sit and have a conversation and to see if that child understands that, okay, this is, understand that they're a sinner and they really want to come to Christ. Now, I'm gonna share this information. That's not our topic today, but I'm going to share this information right 
um, with you all in one of the things, the, the links that I have. So I'm just going to move on from this. Now, making children's ministry exciting. I'm just going to go on to this. Making Sunday school a place, a fun place to be. Learning or review through play using PowerPoint games. And I think that's specifically just because we're online. You don't need to use PowerPoint games. You can do other things. But children seem to be fascinated and, you know, with technology and all of those things. And if there is some sense of familiarity. Now, I'm going to share this. We had done this, I think, probably last month in the North. Um, it's a tutorial that we had done on how to build games using PowerPoint. So one okay. of the things that you can do to learn is to just go to tutorials and find workshops. And uh, right. You can also get downloadable, simple templates online. And I have one of those to share with you all today. So we're just going to move on quickly. One of the games that I like to use, and I, I started recently, is Family Feud. 